Hi, everybody. Um, so I did feel very weird. I'll speak while I'm putting up the PowerPoint. I felt kind of weird to do this, and I assume some of you are feeling weird to be here. But uh, besides the fact that I think it will save our sanity for a little bit, um, there is something to connecting to Eretz Israel. I know that people who are close by, we feel very connected. And people who are far away, your support and your love for us. And I've received so many messages in the last few days. And it, that connection to Eretz Israel is very important. So I hope that this uh enhances that for you um and i guess all i need to say is uh, that whatever torah learning we do here whatever merit we might get a little bit from learning here should be the lebifuat call up to him that everybody should be well and for the safety of all of our children who are serving and that everybody should just come home safely and that medina israel should be safe Okay, let's okay. Uh, let's do some serious things. Um, okay, so the idea for this course was to be a little bit less about history and more how do we connect to the nature of the land. Um, one of the things that I think is very special and unusual uh, about Tanakh, and it's something that is coming to light more and more in the last few decades, is its deep, deep connection to Eretz Yisrael, okay? Um, and not just Tanakh, Mishnah, Gemara, Midrash, right? The, the metaphors, the language that the Nevi'im use, that the rabbis use, that, that everybody uses is coming from the reality that they see all around them. Uh, and not only language, not only metaphors, our, our cycle of holidays, right? It comes out so forcefully now, Sukkot, I said to Rabbi Kalman, this is very appropriate to start now, right after Sukkot, right? When the world was normal, we were just talking about it being after Sukkot. Um, because Sukkot is when we talk about rain and praying for rain and our our hopes that this year the agricultural cycle will be good and water will be good. And of course, all of that is deeply, deeply tied to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, we started to say Mashiva Ruch Morit HaGashem on Sunday. Uh, we actually have had some rain here in the land. Um, we start to say when the last of the pilgrims of the Ole Regal have made it home to Bavel, okay, we're not tied to the cycle in Chutzlars. We're tied to the cycle in Eretz Israel. One of the things that I think is incredible in the last generation, two generations, uh, is how much we have rediscovered these connections. Uh, and we're going to talk about that throughout this course. This course is going to be, I don't even remember how many classes we're doing, five, six, something like that. Okay. And we're going to look at different aspects all along, but we're always going to be bringing up names of people who really are pioneers in rediscovering our connection to the land. Uh, one of the people we're going to talk about a lot today or some of his ideas today is somebody named Nogaharu Veni, who many people will be familiar with as the founder of Neot Kedumim, Neot Kedumim, which is the amazing uh, nature reserve where the flora and the fauna are based on Tanakh and Mishnah. Um, so some of his ideas are going to come up, but we're going to talk about other people like Yuda Felix, like uh, Alexander Eig, uh, the botanical gardens that's here, the, the biblical zoo right? So many different things that have come back. Uh, now that we have come back to the land and we've reconnected to our land, we can reconnect in a much deeper way to Tanakh and to Chazal. So um, this first class is uh, seven and four, right? Which should be able to figure out, I hope, what the numbers are. All right, we're going to talk about the seven species and the four species. The four species, of course, we just finished with Sukkot. The seven species, the Shivat Haminim. A little bit about the ecosystem of Eretz Yisrael, but 
We'll do more about that when we talk about water in the next class, Bezrat Hashem. Um, but I started us off with these two images from archaeology because I really wanted us to understand that connection to the past. So the image that you have on the left uh, is one of the season ladies. I love the season ladies, right? If you go to uh, a few of the Batei Knesset in the Galil, right? The synagogues in the Galil that come from Byzantine times from 1500 years ago. Uh, so some of them have these fabulous mosaics Mosaics, right? And I'm sure many people have seen them or seen pictures of them. Uh, Beit Alpha, Tsipori, this one is from Hamat Tveria. The centerpiece of the mosaics is this amazing zodiac, right? That's an interesting question. Why do Jews have zodiacs? We won't go into that now. Um, and in the corners of the zodiac, zodiac, of course, is the 12 months of the year. And in the corners, you have the four seasons. Right? And the seasons are usually represented by a woman. So this, if you can see the writing, is Kufat Tishrei, right? This is fall. This is Mrs. Fall. Uh, and what is she wearing? She's wearing a lovely fall outfit, okay? Um, but she's also wearing the fruits of fall, right? Look at her, her hand, she's holding grapes. And these are some olive branches hanging around. And in her hair, she's got pomegranates, right? Because we are now, we're going to talk about this a little bit in Chag HaSif, in the holiday of bringing in the produce. The produce has all become ripe or is becoming ripe over the summer and the early fall months. And here we see it represented uh, in this mosaic from 1500 years ago. On the right, maybe not as beautiful, but certainly very important. This is a coin from Bar Kokhva. Okay, from the Bar Kokhva revolt, uh, we have quite a lot of ancient coins. One of the ways that people showed their sovereignty was to make coins in the Bar Kokhva revolt, which was going strong for three years, three and a half years, until it was put down very viciously by the Romans. But they were able to make coins, most of the time over striking uh, existing coins. But this is a very special one, as you can see, I hope you can see, um, it's the four species, right? And uh, you have this lovely etrog over here, okay? Uh, and then you have the aguda, right? You have the tying together of the lulav, okay? Uh, I'm not sure which one is which. I'm going to guess this is a Hadas and an Arava. We're going to talk about all of those. Okay, but they're tied together. Now, what's fascinating, and this has been suggested by scholars, is you can see that there's only one of each, right? Those of us who have taken our four species over Sukkot just last week, how many did we take, right? You have usually, I think it's three of each we take, right? I, my husband puts the Lula and Esrog together, so I'm not 100% sure, but three and two, Rabbi Kalman, or three and three, right? But here you have one and one. Three and two. Okay? Three, now, three are the same two, are about. Three and two, thank you. Um, okay, but here we have one and one. Now you could say, if you were cynical, which I usually am, how much detail could you really put into a coin? Maybe the guy got tired after making one of each. But another way of looking at it, which I think is a beautiful thing, is if you look at the Mishnah in Sukkah, there's a debate about how many of each you need to have. And the one who says one of each is Rabbi Akiva. Who is Bar Kochva's Rebbe is Rabbi Akiva. So is Bar Kochva going according to the idea of his Rebbe? Maybe, right? And that that's really a beautiful uh, indication. Here is something that we just took a week ago, and here it is on an ancient coin from 1800 years ago. So that's, I think, always wonderful to see something like that. Um, okay, so let's get started. Very uh, quick, like I said, we're not going to spend too much time looking at this because we'll do it next time. But um, Egypt and Eretz Israel are very much contrasted with each other in Tanakh. Uh, and one of the ways they are contrasted is in the way we get water. And this is an incredible um, satellite picture of the land of Egypt at night. Okay, uh, Egypt, this is the Sinai over here. This is Eretz Israel over here. But this in the center here, this is Egypt. Egypt is a huge country, okay? But as you can see from the distribution of lights, almost everybody in the country lives along the Nile Delta. That's what this is. This is the Nile. This is a huge burst of light is Cairo. But all the other communities are along the Nile Delta, which opens up at the end over here into the Mediterranean. Nobody lives anywhere else, right? 
Why? Because the Nile is life. And we know that. We know that from Sefer Shemot and the Makot, right? We, we know that the, from the gods of the Egyptians and the, par the Pharaoh who compares himself to the Nile, the Nile is life. Without the Nile, Egypt does not exist, okay? Now, when the Jews leave Egypt, when they're in the desert, when the children of Israel are in the desert, and they're getting ready to go into Eretz Israel, we have Moshe's long speech in Sefer Devarim, they're probably a little concerned, right? And Moshe says to them in Perak Yud Aleph, bashama, uh, lo mitzrayim hi. the land you're coming into is not like Egypt, right? Why is Egypt good? Because you live, it says the continuation of the Pasuk, you live along the, the Nile, and all you have to do is schlep those buckets of water, right? Usually they had a water wheel, that's the Biraglecha, right? They would pedal the water wheel, and the water would go up and irrigate the fields. You never have to worry about water in Egypt. You have to work hard. You have to schlep that water, but you never have to worry about water because there's always water. The Nile is not going to run dry. So Moshe says, this land is not that land, right? What's this land? This is Eretz Harim Ubaka'ot Lematar Hashamayim Tishtemayim. Okay, so this is not an awesome map, but it's good enough to understand, right? We are a land of hills and valleys. We do not have any rivers worthy of the name, right? When Mark Twain come to, came to Israel and saw the mighty river Jordan, he was exceedingly disappointed, okay? We have nothing, we have no, certainly nothing compared to the Nile. Our rivers are very, very puny. Where's our water? Our water comes from the rain. It comes from springs. We're going to talk about this again, right? Now, on the one hand, we don't have that security of the Nile. On the other hand, and Chazal talk about this, if we are righteous, and of course, that's the whole Vayayim Shamoa, and we'll discuss that more next time. If we do the right thing, we don't have to work. God makes it rain, right? God makes it rain and irrigates our fields for us. But there's a price. There's a price, right? In the continuation of the Pasuk, Eretz Asher Adonai Elohecha Doresh Ota Tamid, Mireshit Hashana Ba'ad Acharit Hashana. We are constantly under the supervision of HaKadosh Baruch Hu for good and for bad behave and we'll get water. Don't behave and we won't. So we are in a land that its inherent holiness is set up in its ecosystem. Okay. And like I said, we'll come back to water, but but that's very important to understand how the Torah sets that up. Okay. Um, the description that is most often given for Eretz Yisrael is we are Eretz Zavach Halav Udvash. We are a land of milk and honey, which is positive or negative. If I were to take a little poll of all of you, I am assuming that 95% of you would say positive. Eretz Zavach Halav Udvash. That's a good thing, right? That's a very good thing. Not so good, right? Why is it not so good, okay? Um, it's not so good because what it means is that if it's Zavat Chalav Udvash, it means the land is not being worked, okay? Um, it means that there's been destruction. There's been, there's no agriculture. Uh, and we get that from this, these verses in the book of Isaiah, okay? Um, I have them here for you in Hebrew and in English, because Yishayahu is a little harder language than Devarim. Vaya mirov asok chalav yochal chema, ki chema udvash yochal kol hanotar bekever ha'ar. It's the main word here being notar, right? You'll have so much milk that you'll eat curds. Everyone who is left in the land shall feed on curds and honey. Vaya bayom hu yekom akom asher yel sham elef gefen be'elef kesef, lishamir ulishay iyeh. For in that day, every spot where there could stand a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver shall become a wilderness of thorn bush and thistle. When do you have milk and honey? You have milk from goats, from sheep, because they have land to graze on. Land to graze on is not agricultural land. When do you have honey? When you have a lot of wildflowers and you have a lot of thorns and the bees can come and they can pollinate those flowers and make honey. But that's not agriculture. Okay, we want to have those thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver. So this image of a land of milk and honey, it might be good for the shepherds. It's not good for the farmers. And Eretz Israel, as we're going to see later when we talk about the Arba Minim, eventually we want to become a farming society. We want to become an agricultural society. So Eretz Avachalav Udvash 
isn't a, still a land of abundance, but it, it's a complicated land of abundance. We want to focus more on the seven species because that's an abundance that is from our hard work as well as from what God is giving us. Okay, so the seven species, of course, we have also written in Sefer Devarim, Parakhet. There's so much beautiful artwork out there of the seven species. Everybody loves the Shivan Haminim, and especially those like great JNF posters, all those propaganda posters from the 40s and the 50s, right? We love those seven species. Um, and I have this great set of stamps over here, but let's just review them for a second, right? Eretz Chita Useora, wheat and barley, Gefen Uteina, uh, vines and figs, Rimon, right? Pomegranates. Eretz Zeit Shemen, olive oil, Udvash, and honey. We'll come back to the honey. Okay, so um, we're going to take, we're going to go through each one, but I want us to also understand all of them, why these particular seven, because as we're going to see, if we get to it at the end, there are other indigenous species in the land of Israel. Okay, today when you say Israel, we say Jaffa oranges, we say uh, you know, all these different things that we grow here. But um, but there are even in Tanakh times there were other indigenous species. Why are these seven special? Okay, so we'll come to that in one moment. But just to understand, first of all, just halachically what makes them set special, right? Uh, we'll get to the very specialness of the top three, right? Daganti Rosh Vitar. But even the other ones we say special. Brachot on. Okay, uh, but these seven are the only ones that can be used for bikurim. Okay, mi reshit, not just reshit, right? Shivatan minim shnishvabcha b'hem eretz Israel, afkan shervech eretz Israel shehin shivatan minim, right? The Sifri talks about the only species that can be brought for bikurim. Uh, I have, uh, I don't know, a beautiful uh, lemon tree in my backyard. I can't bring that to the Beit HaMikdash for my bikurim. I can only bring from the seven species. By the way, as we'll see as we go along, these species are mostly not ready on Shavuot, right? When we talk about bringing Bikurim, we talk about Shavuot, right? Salenu al we're bringing those baskets. Really, we're not, right? Because by Shavuot, pretty much only the wheat and the barley are ready. All the others are going to get ready over the course of the summer and even into the fall. Uh, and that's why you can bring Bikurim until Sukkot and even without saying the, the special Psukim until Hanukkah because you have certain species that are just not ready yet, okay? Bikurim was always a big deal in early Zionism. Uh, the Kibbutzim, they didn't necessarily follow this idea of the Shibat Haminim, but this idea of first fruits and the first fruits. And there's some beautiful, wonderful pictures here from like the 20s, the 30s, the 40s uh, of people bringing their Bikurim. And even today, anyone who's in Israel for Shavuot and anywhere where there are kids, you know, that the, the kids, they make, uh, they make crowns of flowers and they bring their baskets of fruit and they do parades and it, it's a very beautiful thing. So this is definitely something that's come back uh, in Zionism today. But why these seven? Okay, and this is where we get to the first thing we're going to learn from Noga Haruveni. Okay, Noga Haruveni, uh, just very briefly, his parents were Ephraim and Hana Haruveni. They were basically the founders of the... Um, botany department in the Hebrew University, right? The very beginnings of Hebrew University are uh, all these uh, new departments. And they are the ones who say we have to have, you know, a study of botany of Eretz Israel. They collect all these samples of different plants. Uh, they really were trailblazers in that field. And their son, their, their son and their daughter, right? Noga is their son, Ayala Tashachar, I think is their daughter. Um, both of them also very involved in understanding the land. Um, Noga wrote books about uh, the land in Tanakh, right? Probably his most famous early book is called Or Chadash Al Sefer Yirmiyahu, where he does something which today everybody does, but in the 50s, he was one of the first to do, which is take a look at the geography, at the topography, at the land of Yirmiyahu, right? How does he connect to the land? Um, as he got older in the 60s and the 70s, he had this dream that he was going to create a biblical nature reserve. And basically, he got land near what today is Modi'in. It was nothing. It was wasteland. 
Uh, I have a, a friend uh, quite a bit older than me who remembers going on a tour with him in the 60s. And he would point out at these barren slopes and he'd say, and the lake will be here and the fields will be here. And, and they are. Right? They really are. Um, and so he created this nature reserve called Neot Kedumim, which is species of Tanakh, but more importantly, which has so much information. He wrote books about the plants and the animals of Tanakh and why they're important. So this is his idea. And he says, what's so special about these seven, right? If you go back to the early years of Am Yisrael, the powerful god in Eretz Canaan is this gentleman here on the left, and that's the Baal, right? We have innumerable renditions of the Baal all around our area in Eretz Canaan, in, uh, in Lebanon, Sor and Sidon, um, the Baal is a storm god. The Baal is a rain god. Uh, and he's the most powerful god in our region. Now, all of the seven species have a very critical ripening period between Pesach and Shavuot, and continuing on to Sukkot, but Pesach and Shavuot is really the crucial time where you need just the right amount of rain, of sun, of wind, right? Farming is a very tricky business, even today in modern times, certainly in ancient times. You need just the right amount of everything. Anybody who's ever been in Israel between Pesach and Shavuot, right, you know, I have a good friend who says, you never put your winter clothes away until Shavuot, right? Because the weather is very unpredictable. It could be boiling hot. It could be raining the next day. It could be cold. You never know what it's going to be. Now, if you are bring, if these fruits succeed, right, it means that one God who controls the east wind and the north wind and the south wind and the west wind and the rain and the sun, and he is making it work, right? Whereas the Baal, we don't want to thank the Baal. Now, your crops, your easy crops, we're going to see towards the end, there are certain crops that grow regardless. They don't need that. They can grow even in times of famine. If we were able to bring the easy crops, like carobs, okay, like, like nuts, then people would say, oh, well, it was the Baal. We're going to thank the Baal. He's the one who did it. No, no, no. We want to thank Hashem because Hashem is responsible for everything and not the God of this and the God of that and the God of the other thing. And these fruits, when they work, when it all comes together and it works, there's clearly one guiding hand and that's Hashem's guiding hand. Uh, and, and that's why Nogar Rubaini says these fruits are really the special ones. Now he adds in something else very beautiful. Um, what are the top three of these seven? The Ganti Rosh Yitzhar, right? We talk about them in Vayayim Shamoa, the grain, the wine, and the oil. Now, they're the top three because you can't survive without them. But they're also the top three because these are the ones, first of all, that we have in the temple, right? In the Mikdash. And that's in the picture that you have here uh, on the left, okay? You have the menorah, which, of course, is lit with olive oil. Okay? You have the Shulchan. Okay, you have the shulchan, which is for the bread. Okay? Uh, the grapes we don't really have here. This is the Mizbeach HaKtoret. But we do have wine in the Mikdash as well, right? We have Nisu Hayayin as well as Nisu Hamayin. We pour wine on the Mizbeach. So wine, grain, and oil are used in the Mikdash. They're also used on our table on Shabbat, right? We have challah. We have wine. We have the olive oil to light the candles. So not only do we bring the Mikdash into our homes every Friday night and every Shabbat, okay, but we also bring Eretz Yisrael into our homes. Right? And that's Nogar Reuveni's idea, which I think is a really a beautiful idea. Uh, our table, Shulchanosha Adam Mechaperet Alav, right? We talk about our table being a Mizbeach, being an altar. Okay? So we're bringing the Mikdash into our home, but we're also bringing Eretz Yisrael into our home wherever we may be in the world. Okay, um, so with that kind of an introduction, we're going to take a look at each one of these species. Um, so probably, uh, the, certainly of the two grains, the wheat is the primary one, right? Wheat is, uh, is the, the much finer, better grain that we want to eat our bread from. Um, it takes a lot of work. 
to make to to make bread. And this is the Gemara that we have in Brachot, right? Ben Zoma would say, how much effort did Adam exert before he found bread to eat? He plowed, sowed, reaped, sheaved, threshed, winnowed, separated, ground, sifted, kneaded, and baked, and only thereafter he ate. I, on the other hand, wake up and I find all of these prepared for me. All right, well, your wife might have done a little bit of work there, but okay. But but there's still, there, there's an enormous amount of work that goes into putting seeds into the ground and having them grow and their crops succeeding and being able to have enough wheat. We'll see in a minute how much you need in order to actually make enough flour to make bread. Um, and, and we have a lot of metaphors in Tanakh about sowing and reaping because sowing and reaping, there's a lot that can happen between when I put the seeds in the ground and when those that that wheat is finally ready, right? Uh, the most famous one, of course, is Hazor Imbedim Abimina Iksoru, right? Where we're going to sow our seeds with crying and we're going to and we're going to laugh when we when we finally are able to reap them. But we also have uh, you know metaphors that are harsher, right? Like from Hosea, Kiruach Yisrau v'sufa sufata Iksoru, you will sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. Okay, uh, somehow I, I find that more powerful in English than in Hebrew. Maybe that's just because, you know, literature that we have. Harashtem resha avlatak tsartem, also in Hosea, uh, phrases that we can uh, relate to today, right? You have sowed evil and you have reaped even more wickedness. Um, once you have your wheat, Okay, it takes an awful lot of work to make it into flour. Okay, you need these millstones, these avnei rechaim. Just to give you an idea, uh, you know, we uh, I remember when one of my kids was in uh, was in Gan, and we did an activity for Shavuot. Uh, they came and they brought it must have been like a huge U-Haul full of wheat stalks. Okay, and we had the kids come in and we we did dash right. We did the threshing. We did. We ended up I think with maybe like a half a bowl of flour, right? Okay, maybe the kids weren't so careful, but still, it's a huge amount of work to get even the smallest amount of flour to eat. Um, this woman who is grinding here with these millstones, these hand millstones, which everybody had in their house in ancient times, you have to turn that millstone for a full hour till you can get a kilo, one of those nice little bags of flour, okay? So it's it's a ton of work. Millstones are, um, are very important in this economy, right? Without millstones, you can't survive. So we have this basic idea, right? Uh, you can't, you cannot take as collateral for a loan from a poor person, they're millstones because how are they gonna eat bread, right? Um, if, uh, the Gemara in Ketubot says you cannot tell your wife that she can't lend out or borrow millstones from her neighbor because then nobody's going to talk to her, right? This is a basic tool that everybody needs, that everybody needs to use. It's also a metaphor, right? We have the Gemara in Ketushin says, Rabbi Huda says that Shmuel says you should marry and then you should study Torah, right? We have a difference of opinion. We won't get into the whole Gemara. But should you marry first or should you study first? Rabbi Yochanan says, how can one do this? With a millstone hanging from his neck, right? You have this huge responsibility of providing for your family. How can you engage in Torah study? So you also get a sense of how heavy these things are, right? You have this millstone around your neck. So a lot of work, a lot of tears, a lot of effort going into providing bread. Um, Barley, right? We did chita. We're now up to seora. Barley. Barley is an inferior grain. Okay. Uh, why do we grow it? Mostly for animals. Uh, it can grow with less water. It doesn't need as much water. It can grow in much harsher conditions. This is why uh, it can grow in the what's called the Sfar Hamidbar, the edge of the desert. And in fact, we only have one uh, one Tana who says that you can give if you're, you know, you have to give your divorced wife mizonot, right? You have to give her food. And the Gemara talks about, the Mishnah talks about what you have to give. Only one Tana, Rabbi Ishmael says, you can give sa'ura instead of chita. As Rabbi Ishmael lived in the Darom, he lived on the edge of the desert. So for him, sa'ura was a legitimate food. But in general, it's animal food, not something that people would eat so much. Um, it ripens early, 
the seorah is the first before the chita, right? What do we bring our minchat uh, haomer, right? Right, the second day, the, the second night of Pesach, right? We we bring our minchat haomer comes from the seorah. We hear about seorah in Shmot with the makot, right? With barad. Okay, what does that mean? Aviv, aviv, which we use as the word spring, right? But it means that the the seorah was already hard, right? The stalks were hard, and therefore, when the the um, the barad, when the hail comes. It knocks down the barley. It, it renders it unusable, right? It destroys it. Um, the picture on the left, you can see the Karaites actually still till today, they go out into the fields uh, at the end of the month of Adar to see if the barley is ripe. And if the barley is not ripe, they add a leap year, right? And we used to do this too. Uh, we have the Gemara talks about this. Um, we don't do it anymore because we have a, a fixed calendar, but the Karaites don't rely on that. They go out and they say, is the barley ripe? If the barley is not ripe, we add another month, right? What do we use barley for besides uh, animal food? We use it for beer. Beer is very important. It's a wonderful exhibit now in the Israel Museum. God willing, everything should quiet down. Should be able Able to go see it. It's called the feast, uh, and it talks about what did people eat at these fabulous feasts that kings would make. And one of the major things was beer. We didn't make beer so much, but our neighbors, the Plishtim, made beer, and they made it out of barley, out of hops. Um, and you can see these special beer jugs that have strainers, right? Because there's all the sediment on the bottom that they needed to strain out the beer so that you wouldn't get that. So that's our seora. Okay, we are coming to the king of the fruit. If the king of the grains is wheat, uh, the king of the fruit is grapes, right? Grapes are super important. Oh, I see somebody doesn't like that. I said barley is of less value. It's not as yummy. I'm sorry. It, it just doesn't, it's not as good, right? If you have barley bread or wheat bread, okay, today we eat all kinds of crazy bread because, you know, we're all the fads of, you know, uh, what, uh, what you should eat and what you shouldn't have and gluten and blah, blah, blah. But in the old days, they knew what was good. Wheat bread is good. Barley bread is not as good. What can I tell you? Um, you can all argue with me in the chat. I don't care. Um, okay, grapes. Grapes are very, very special, right? They have their own bracha, right? They're the only drink that has its own bracha. Um, and we uh, we put wine on the Mizbeach. It is a very important product, but it is also clearly a product that can lead you astray, right? Ready? One of the earliest stories in the Torah, Noah comes out of the ark, plants grapes, gets drunk, right? We have the, the Nazir who stays away from wine. We have the fear of Avodazara, right? Yain Nesach, we don't want to drink with non-Jews. So wine is a is a double-edged sword, right? We we are we recognize the supremacy, the importance of wine, but on the other hand, we are a little bit fearful of its uh, of its consequences. The pictures that you have here, right, Batya, this is for you if you recognize it. These are the vineyards outside Shiloh. Um, and uh, wine, right, wine and wine making come back are coming back today, right? In Tanakh times, in Mishnaic times, Eretz Yisrael was the center of winemaking, of wine production. We made a lot of wine. Uh, if you, in archaeology, we are always finding wine presses, gitot from very simple ones, like the one you see here on the right, to much more sophisticated ones. Uh, all of that came to a halt with the Muslim conquest in the seventh century. One of the tenets of Islam is not to drink wine, not to drink alcohol. So grapes were still grown, but wine was not made. And we kind of lost these the, this skill of making wine. And it only started again with Zionism. Uh, Baron Rothschild, right? Frenchman said, what's a good crop to grow? Let's grow grapes to make wine. Um, but only in the last, and anyone who knows anything about wine, I don't really, except I go to, to wineries with people. Um, but anyone who knows anything about wine knows that in the last 20, 30 years, there's been a wine renaissance in Israel. And we have tons of wineries. Uh, and even now, what I think is actually much more interesting is you have people from various universities, Ariel University, Bar Ilan University, that are trying to find the biblical varieties of grapes, 
uh, and trying to grow them again. And they actually are growing them again so that we can drink the wine uh, that was drunk in, in the time of Tanakh and that David Amelch is talking about here, V'yayin Yismach Levav Enosh, wine cheers the hearts of men, L'Hatzil Panim Mishem, and right, we have all our three here to make our oil that makes the face shine, V'lechem Levav Enosh Isad, and bread that sustains man's life. So we have our Daganti Rosh and Yitzhar. Um, Okay, figs. Figs are beautiful, beautiful trees. Um, where do we hear about figs? We hear about figs already on like the second page of the Torah. Okay, after Adam and Chava eat from Etadat, which according to Chazal, perhaps one of the suggestions is that it was a fig, right? Why? Because once their eyes are open and they see they're naked, uh, what do we grab? We grab those big fig leaves. If you've ever seen fig leaves, you know that they can serve very nicely uh, as a bikini. Um, but uh, but uh, the, the proximity of the tree led Chazal to say, well, maybe Etadat was really uh, a fig tree, right? So that's what we have here. Their eyes were both open. They perceived they were naked. They sewed together fig leaves and they made themselves loincloths. Um, figs, fig trees love water. Okay, figs grow. Fig trees don't tend to grow up. They tend to grow out. They become very wide. Okay, they're like uh, they're like olive trees. Anyone who has a fig tree in their yard knows that figs can grow very very large. And figs actually their roots can go very deep, searching for water. They love water. And that's why a lot of people don't like having fig trees in your their yard because they'll actually grow down to your pipes. Um, if you see a fig tree that is really thriving and flourishing, it's because it's found a source of water, whether that's sewage or a spring or an ancient mikvah, like in the picture over here on the right. Um, baby figs, like in this picture here on the left, baby figs are called pagim. Okay, um, uh, in, uh, in Shira Shirim. Uh, one of the beautiful ways that modern Hebrew uh, changes language is if you go today to a hospital uh, in Israel, the neonatal ward is the Pagia and uh, preemie babies are Pagim. That's where we get that word from. Um, figs are a fascinating tree because if you've ever seen fig trees, you don't harvest your figs all at once. You don't go out at the end of the summer and say, let's harvest the figs. Uh, figs ripen little by little. So every day you have a few figs. You can go out to your tree all summer long and collect a couple of figs to have for breakfast. And tomorrow there'll be some more figs that are ripe. Uh, Chazal, of course, know this, and they use it as a beautiful metaphor. Right? And they say, Torah should be like a fig tree don't sit down. You know, some of us sit down on Shabbos afternoon and we do all our dafyomi, right? Or we do all the Torah that we didn't manage to learn all week. No, you should learn a little bit of Torah every day, little by little, when you're ripe, right? When you're ripe for that Torah, that's when you should learn that Torah. Um, okay. One other thing about a fig, right? Classically, the imagery in Tanakh of peacetime is that everyone is going to sit under their vine and their fig tree, right? Ish tachat gafno, v'tachat te'enato, right? Nice and shady under the fig tree, good place to sit. Um, a rimon, okay, pomegranate. <laughs> Again, about the barley. Um, okay, a pomegranate. Pomegranates are a rather strange fruit. Um, they are they are beautiful on the outside, but their outside really doesn't give much of an indication of their inside. Meaning we eat the inside and we don't eat the outside, which is usually the opposite in most fruits. Um, and of course, because they are so unusual in that way, they have become uh, a metaphor, right? So uh, Chazal talk about how the outer appearance of the pomegranate doesn't really reveal its inner bounty, right? And Am Yisrael, Ein Lahem Rekanim, right? There are no empty people in Am Yisrael. Everybody is full of seeds like the Rimon, despite how they might look on the outside. Um, sometimes you have to discard the outside in order to get the goodness inside. And that's the very famous metaphor uh, about um, Acher, Alicia Ben Abuya, right? Who was a brilliant Talmudic scholar, uh, teacher of Rabbi Meir, but he became a heretic. 
he went over to the side of the Romans. And when people saw Rabbi Meir still studying Torah with Acher, they said, how can you study Torah with this heretic? And Rabbi Meir found a pomegranate, ate its contents, and threw away its peels. Um, so and we talk about the 613 seas, and we're full of mitzvot like a Rimon, right? Many, many beautiful metaphors. Uh, Rimonim, pomegranates, are actually... Um, today we know, and they knew in the time of Chazal also, that pomegranates are a superfood. Today we know even more. Uh, we think they produce, uh, they stop cancer producing cells. They reduce your blood pressure. They do all kinds of wonderful things for you. Um, there's a winery in the north called the Rimon Winery that uh, makes Rimon wine, but now they're also making all of these like extracts that are used for medicinal purposes. Um, but the other thing about pomegranates is besides their strangeness, right? They're being kind of inside out is if the fruits were to hold a beauty contest, Rimonium would win hands down, right? They are the most beautiful fruit. And that's why they're everywhere from contemporary Judaica to ancient archeology. span you, you see them all over, you go back to Shira Shirim, right? Uh, the, the Raya, the, the beloved is described and and one of the metaphors used for her is kipela harimon rakatech. Your forehead is like a pomegranate. You see them in archaeology. You see them in uh, the robe of the Kohen Gadol, of the high priest, paamon virimon, right? You have pomegranates and bells. Even today, the 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 tops of the Torah scrolls are called rimonim. It's what you're seeing here. Um, coins, mosaics, everywhere, right? We even have this incredibly beautiful description. Uh, one of the Amoraim, Rabbi Yochanan, was supposed to be so beautiful, and they, the Chazal struggled to think how to describe his beauty, right? Because you couldn't see pictures of him. He said, take a, sell, a silver cup, fill it with pomegranate seeds, put it partly in the sun and partly in the shade, and then you'll have a sense of Rabbi Yochanan's beauty, right? So this is this, this very lovely image. So pomegranates definitely win the award for the most beautiful fruit. Uh, olives, also nice looking. Not as much, uh, but olives, of course, are very, very important. First of all, olive trees are fascinating trees. Olive trees grow very, very old. Um, and again, like the figs, they grow wide, right? They don't grow tall, they grow wide. Uh, this olive tree on the left here is, uh, I believe I took this picture from um, pictures of the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Gatchmanim, uh, olives, right? Olives grow on the Mountain of Olives, on Harazetim. At the foot of the Mount of Olives is a garden called uh, Gatchmanim, the place of olive pressing, right? And this is very important to Christians. It's where it's supposed to be that Jesus spent his last night. But there's in the garden, there are olive trees there that well, Christians say go back to the time of Jesus. I don't know if they're 2,000 years old, but they're certainly 1,000 years old. Olive trees can grow to be 1,000 years old easily. Um, one of the fascinating things about olive trees, you don't see it, you can see it a little bit in this picture, but if you see olive trees, they almost always have a ring of shoots of baby olives baby olive trees growing up around them that eventually will grow and attach to the main trunk, okay? Um, and the Mizmor of uh, Tehillim takes this imagery in such a beautiful way, and that's what I have here. Eshtecha kegef in Poriah, your wife will be like a fruitful vine, biyarkete betecha, within your house. Banecha kishtile zeitim saviv l'sholchancha. Your sons are like olive saplings around your table. Now you read that and you say, a nice metaphor, but if you understand what it means, it means exactly what you see in nature, right? The saplings, the baby trees are around the Ima and the Abba tree. That's exactly what uh, what the, the Mizmor is describing. Um, the olive leaves are also very interesting. This is another idea from Nogar Ruveni. They are kind of a green on one side and a much paler color, almost a grayish color on the other side. And Nogar Ruveni talks about how when the wind blows and the tree's leaves shake, they almost look like light, right? They almost look silvery. They almost look like they're on fire. So uh, you know, it's a very fitting image for a tree that produces fruit that illuminates the Beit HaMikdash. Um, olives are good 
you could get everything you need out of an olive. We're going to talk about uh, date palms in a minute and how much you could get out of date palms. But olives, just the fruit themselves, every last bit of it is important. Uh, we talk about katit, right? Katit is what is in English, we call it extra virgin, right? EVO, extra virgin olive oil. Um, all of the olive oil that's produced in the land of Israel, by the way, is extra virgin. Uh, we don't produce any lower quality than that. Um, for the Beit HaMikdash, you would only give the katit, meaning that first press, right? That's what it means, extra virgin. The first press is the best oil. That goes to the Beit HaVikdash. But in ancient times, there was a lot more good to get out of the olive. We don't want to waste all the rest. So you continue, right? And you press some more, and you press some more, and you press some more until all you have left, after you've gotten out all the olives, you, olive oil you can get, then you have all the gunk, right? Uh, and you press more. Did I bring a picture of this? No, I didn't. But uh, first, you take all the stuff that's left after that first press, you put it in baskets, you put weight on it, you get out more oil, more oil, more oil, until finally the only thing that's left are the skins and the crushed pits. But even that has tons of oil inside. And what they did in ancient times, and we are doing it again today, everything that's old is new again, uh, is they would make that into fuel. And the Mishnah talks about something called gefet, right? Ein tom nimba gefet. You shouldn't put your Shabbos food into this olive gunk because it's so volatile. It can stay warm even without a fire. And today we take all of that olive gunk that comes out from the olive presses uh, and we fashion it into logs that can be used for fuel. Right? This is very nice, uh, eco-safe beautiful recycled fuel. So olives can be used until the very, very last drop. Of course, olive oil is super important in the Beit HaMikdash, right? It's the only oil that you are allowed to use in the menorah. It's the oil that's used for the Shemen HaMishcha, right? The special oil that anoints uh, the kelim, the vessels in the Beit HaMikdash, that anoints the, the Kohen Gadol, that is going to anoint the Mashiach, right? That anointed the kings. Um, how about in your home? So we have this, this Mishnah that I'm sure a lot of people recognize from saying Bamem Madlikin, right? Uh, Rabbi Shmuel says that... Um, Right, Rabbi Shmuel says that one may not light with tar, with itran on Shabbat. The rabbis permit lighting with all oils, right? And then we have all this list of oils, shem and shum shumim, shem and egozim, shem and snow note, right? All these different things. Um, Rabbi Tarfon says only olive oil. Now, that's fascinating. What we don't have it in the Mishnah, but in the Tosefta, Rabbi Tarfon is challenged by another Tana, whose name is Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri. And he says, Rabbi Tarfon, you're a very rich guy. Very nice for you. Light, light your lamps on Shabbos with olive oil. The rest of us might not be able to afford that. Or maybe we don't live in Eretz Israel where it's easy to get olive oil. So we have to allow all of these other oils. But Rabbi Tarfon says, if you can afford it, if you can do it, only olive oil, right? So definitely something that is important in the Beit HaMikdash. Okay, um, our last uh, of the seven is the Tamar. Uh, now it doesn't say Tamar, it says Dvash. We'll come to that in a minute. Okay, but first let's talk about the Tamarim. Um, one of the things that's fascinating, I brought this here from the Rambam, you also can see it in the Gemara, Almost each one of the seven species has its own verb for harvesting, which gives you a sense of how important each one of these are. And we still use most of them in modern Hebrew, which is nice. Kotzer tfua o kitnit, right? So the kotzer is for the chita and the saora. Botzer anavim. Goder, or we say today gdid, right? Not gdar, but gdid, but it's the same thing. Goder tmarim. Mesik zeitim. Okay, we still use that today. We talk about the Mesik, we talk about the Gedid. Te'enim, I don't think we use the, this word, ore te'enim, just probably because there's not so much widespread harvesting of figs, but there is this verb. So I just, I, I think that's a beautiful indication of how important uh, each of these species are, that they each has their own verb, right? Language tells you a lot about priorities. Um, Dates in the land of Israel, right? Today, you drive around, you go to the Jordan Valley, you go down towards Jericho, towards the Dead Sea. You'll see an abundance of dates. Now is the time. Just two weeks ago, I was with tourists. We were right near the Jordan. We were near Qasr al-Yehud. We drove in. There was like a sign, fresh dates. We drove in. 
They were amazing, super honey, delicious. But believe it or not, 100 years ago, we didn't have good date trees. We didn't have high quality ones um, uh, because uh, the Arabs didn't really develop them. We didn't have good ones uh, and we needed to bring them from other countries, from Egypt and from Iraq. Now, um, this was not something that they were willing to export to us because you didn't want, you wanted to, you know, it's a national treasure. You want to keep that monopoly. And you had this very interesting guy, his name was Ben Sion Yisraeli. Uh, and he went to Iraq in 1933 with 17 Lirot in his pocket. Uh, and he smuggled shoots of date palms back into the land of Israel. He bought that, brought them to Kfutzat Kineret by the Kineret and they were planted there. Uh, and then the children of these shoots were sent all over the land of Israel. He actually made seven more trips. All of this was illegal smuggling, stealing, but he did it and every time he went. He would meet different communities. He would tell them about Eretz Israel. but he did this under great danger. The Yishuv didn't even want him to do it because they were worried that he would be caught, but he kept on doing it. And most of the dates that we have today in Israel come from Ben Sion Yisraeli's smuggling trips. So that's just a pretty wild little fact because it is one of the seven species, but over time we lost the good quality of them here. Now, as you recall, when we started talking a half hour ago, we mentioned that uh, the, in the Pasuk, it doesn't say Tamar. It says Eretz Zechemen Udvash. Okay, Dvash is another word for Tamar. Now, when we say Dvash in modern Hebrew, we mean honey, right? We mean bee honey. Um, but in Tanakh, Dvash sometimes will mean bee honey. We'll see that in a moment. But often it will mean what we today call silan, right? Date honey. The dates and these dates that I had two weeks ago were so sweet that they literally were dripping with the juice and you can make honey out of them. Um, and that's what it refers to when Tanakh is talking about uh, Dvash, we do have, and I don't think we'll read it, but we do have two stories in Tanakh that I brought here of bee honey, both of them wild bee honey, right? I'll just show you for a moment. Uh, one of them is with Shimshon, right? Famous story, Shimshon is going down to Timna. He encounters a lion, the lion attacks him. He rips the lion apart because he's Shimshon. Then he comes back uh, a while later and he sees that in the lion, there are a colony of bees and they've made honey and he creates a riddle out of this, okay, wild bees. Same thing in Sefer Shmuel, we have Yonatan, Shaul's son. He goes out and he's very hungry. He's been fighting all day. He sees a beehive and he takes some honey and we have this great pasuk, right? Look at the bottom on the right column. He put out the stick he had with him, dipped it into the beehive, brought his hand back to his mouth and his eyes lit up, oru enav, right? He had that sugar rush, it was so good, right? But both these times, this is wild honey. What about bee honey? Do we have bee honey? So not so long ago in a tell in the Beit Sha'an rally, tell Rehov, uh, they found beehives. They found over 30 beehives that were man-made. That's what these little tunnels here, these little uh, tubes are. They are man-made beehives that are meant for bees to colonize in so that you could then reap the honey. These are 2,700 years old. They go back to the time uh, of Tanakh, of Bayit Rishon. Uh, and this is our first real evidence. We have pictures from Egypt of beehives like this, but this is our first real evidence of actual physical beehives in the land of Israel. So we did cultivate honey here. Um, Date palms uh, are an amazing product. We think of dates and maybe we think of a lulav, but really nothing ever goes to waste in a date palm. Uh, if you go down to the Bedouin, the Sinai, they use every piece of the date palm. Uh, they use the leaves, they use the branches, they make baskets, they make huts, they make brooms, they use everything. We use the lulav, right? And we eat the dates, but Chazal knew that everything was used. And we have this very beautiful medrash. As no part of the palm has any waste, the dates 
are eaten, the branches are used for halal, right? That's the lulav, the twigs for covering the sukkah, the fibers for ropes, the leaves for brooms, the boards for roofs. So there are none worthless in Israel. Some are versed in scripture, some in Mishnah, some in Talmud, some in Agada, right? Everybody has their place in Am Yisrael. Everybody has their job. Everybody has their tafkid, just like every part of the date is, is used. Um, my last date, okay, and then we'll do the Arba Minim very quickly, but uh, this is the best date story, and that's the story of Methuselah, okay? Um, a few decades ago, there were date pits that were discovered in the excavations in Masada, okay? Not date pits from somebody's lunch from the excavators, but from somebody's lunch 2,000 years ago. These pits were brought down uh, to uh, kibbutz in the Aravat, to kibbutz Ketura. There were a couple of researchers, the famous one is Dr. Elaine Soloway, who managed to germinate some of these seeds, these 2000 year old pits and grow them into a tree. This is Methuselah, uh, that's the tree on the left here. Uh, and of course they wanted Methuselah to produce dates because we wanna taste what 2000 year old dates taste like. However, dates like people require a male and a female uh, date palm. They come in male and female and Methuselah was a boy. You needed a girl. Uh, they didn't give up. They went back. They got more pits that were found in the excavations in Qumran and they managed to germinate more plants. And finally they had a winner, Eve, it's the other tree. Uh, and they managed to produce, da produce dates uh, last year, two years ago, they actually were able to eat the dates, the 2000 year old dates. Okay, um, we're gonna quickly in our last five minutes talk about the other three of the four species because the tamar, the dates are in both, right? They're in the seven species and in the four species. Um, so the Torah says, right? We just read this last week. Right, we're going to see some of these things are very clear, some are very not. Okay, the product of Hadar trees, what the heck does that mean? Branches of palm trees, we know what that is, right? And we have it here in the Shalom al Yisrael mosaic in the Beit Knesset in Yericho. We have a picture of a lulav right here. Um, Bows of leafy trees, enough it's a vote. What does that mean? Arve nachal, a little bit more clear. But again, we don't 100% know what all these things are, but these are what we're supposed to take on Sukkot. So the lulav, we already know. pre hadar, very tricky. How do we know what a pre hadar is? So the Gemara goes and says, it's an it's it's a pre that the pre is beautiful and the tree is beautiful. And then the Yerushalmi goes through a few options. He says, Ramon, oh, we already know the Ramon is beautiful. The tree, oh, less beautiful. Caribs, Haruv, beautiful tree. Caribs, not so beautiful, right? What's a tree that's a fruit is beautiful and the tree is beautiful? Etrog, right? But also they add another nice thing. Eitz Shapiro. Dar bi'ilano mishana lishana. Hadar bi'ilano mishana lishana. It lives on the tree all year long. You can pick your etrog now. You can leave your etrog for three months. It'll just get bigger. It doesn't go bad. Okay, so that's the other interpretation. Um, and etrog is a symbol of fertility because of that. Right, uh, and uh, etrog has been defined as an etrog certainly since the time of Chazal, probably before that as well. Arve nachal, okay, arve nachal are aravot that live by the side of the water. Aravot, if an etrog is a symbol of fertility, and arava is a symbol of water. Okay, we want water. And that's why we say our Hoshanot, uh, they would bring the Arava from Moza. It's a picture of the Beit Knesset in Moza. They would bring them from Moza, which was a place of many springs. It's an ideal place for Arava to grow and they need a water source. They would bring them to the Beit HaMikdash. They would set them up around the Mizbeach and go around, say Hoshana. Why? Because Arava need water, right? Anyone who has their Arba Minim, knows the Arabo, you wrap them up in those wet paper towels, you put them in the refrigerator or you put them in a vase because without water, the Arava is going to die. And if you have these droopy Aravot on the Mizbeach, that's saying, Hashem, we need water. That's what we need. We must have water. Okay? Um, and, and that's where the uh, the idea of the Arava comes from. Anaf Eitz Avot, 
became interpreted as the hadas, okay? The myrtle, a uh, symbol of immortality, uh, a symbol of beauty. And okay? we have this wonderful story of Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai after he spent 13 years in the cave hiding from the Romans, 12 years he comes out, he sees that people are going to work, he's very angry, he destroys things. A voice comes out and says, if you want to destroy my world, go back to the cave. He goes back to the cave, he comes out a year later, and he sees this old man carrying two bundles of Hadassim. Why is he carrying them? Lichvod Shabbat. One is for Zahor, one is for Shamor, and then he's reconciled. He says, wow, Kama Chavivim HaMitzvot Israel. right? These mitzvot are so beautiful to Israel. Um, so we'll do one last final thing. Why these four? Right? And there are a lot of interpretations why these four, um, but I'm going to give you two. Right? One, the one on the uh, exemplified by the symbol on the right is, is the symbol of the Yishuv of Beit Choron, but we've all heard this idea before that uh, each one of the four species represents a different type of person, right? Some people have Torah, some people have, have good deeds, some people have both, some people have none. But Yasu Kulam Agudahat, joined together, we become one perfect people. And really, that's something we are seeing in these last few days on an unbelievable, unbelievable level. Everybody is bringing something else and we are Aguda Achat. Um, really, I should have ended with that, but I'll end with this other idea. Um, and that is, again, an idea from Nogar Ruveni, um, that these four species are our progression in Jewish history. Okay? The lulav is when we are in the desert because we make our sukkot and we learn that you can make a sukkah out of the branches of the date palms. The aravot are when we are camping on the banks of the Jordan. That's what you're seeing in the picture here, right? Um, the hadasim are anaf et a vote, right? Thick forests. When we come into the land of Israel, we're clearing the forest so that we can settle. And the etrog is when we have already reached the settled land uh, and we have stability and we have agriculture and we have reached our stability as a people. But yasu kulam aguda achat. Let's hope that our aguda of Am Israel in the diaspora in Eretz Israel, that we work together to serve Hashem and that we see better days. Um, let's see our comments here Amen. anything all right any comments thank you for all these nice things barley lovers oh mona we're gonna come eat your barley thank you the lulav is backwards which lulav is backwards oh well, i might have put the picture in backwards that's true moza is right near jerusalem um you're welcome. Thank you. It was good for me to teach too. And yes, Amen. Amen. I know you all are davening for us and uh, we are davening for us and we should have good things. And by Kalman, thank you very to much. You. I totally agree with all the comments. Yes, it's uh, very nice to be able to focus on learning and we should hear good news. Thank you very much. Um, some more things I mentioned Rabbi Elliot Schreier of B'nai Shun in Tinek will be giving the Parsha Shir. But instead of being at 8.30, like we normally he asked if we could do it 50 minutes later because there's a rally in Tinek for the Matzav in Israel. So we say, whatever. So we'll start 50 minutes later. And then then please go add my shear on the sitter on Friday morning at 9.15. We're going to go back to the sitter. We're in the middle of Shema, actually, uh, starting at Vayam Shemoa um, after, you know, a number of weeks on the Yom Tovim. So, uh, and then next week, a number of our new series will please go ahead and be starting, you know, uh, Surely kicked off our fall, uh, our fall season. So thank you. And then next week, a whole, whole bunch. And uh, we look forward to hearing good news and to learning. And the Sput of Talmud Torah should bring a Yeshua to the Jewish people. Thank you, everybody. And have a wonderful day. Okay. Soon and and uh, be well, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.